today I'm going to go through the, fi the economics of fiber. I'm, I'm going to kind of go from the high level, discussing five, 5G a little bit, and then I'm going to do a deep dive into the cable systems and how they're deploying fiber deep and the economics behind it. And then hopefully I'll have enough time to wrap that back into appraisal concepts. But before I do that, I, I need to walk through a nightmare I had last night. So yesterday we heard a lot about AI, we heard about automated vehicles, and you heard about my concern about the 400 pound hacker on his bed, getting into the vehicle I'm in and taking control of the vehicle. Last night I was out with Carl and a collection of people, and Carl and I's discussion kind of get into some weird items, and you know, part of it was we got into deep learning, Carl was really into deep learning and AI. We also got into quantum physics and some other things, so I went to bed and may, may have had some wine, uh, may have contributed to it. So I, I, this nightmare just frightened me and I, I woke up this morning and actually Dilbert captured it perfectly. <laughs> so, um, so never get in the car with Carl is what I've learned. <laughs> So uh, let me first go through 5G, and we know 5G needs fiber. We heard about it yesterday. 5G is not going to displace the landline network. It's actually going to augment that network because 5G needs a lot of fiber. So why is that? And I hit on some of these points yesterday on the panel I was on, looking at what 5G is going to trigger in that network. So if you think about it today, the typical LTE cell site uh, throws back about a gig of backhaul demand. So you're needing potentially now even that fiber to the cell site because most technologies, most copper technologies can't deliver that. Uh, most wireline or wireless technologies can't do that. We talked about a little bit yesterday about potentially fiber or uh, wireless backhaul. Uh, it's in the labs and it will come, but it is an expensive technology, but it will be in that network. And then in, uh, when 5G comes out, if you look at that last point on the slide, we're gonna jump up to 10 gigabits coming back on that backhaul link coming from the cell sites. Uh, it's not from every small, small cell radio, but from the collection where they hop back together, you're gonna need that big fat pipe. So how are the providers meeting this demand today? We know the incumbents like AT&T and Verizon are rolling out uh, fiber to their 5G sites in their network. Uh, Verizon in 2017 signed a deal with Corning to buy a uh, billion dollars of fiber. Uh, and most of it was for their Boston area deployment. And that Boston area deployment is rife with potential for 5G. Incumbents like Comcast and Charter and Cox and CenturyLink are rolling out fiber. Zayo uh, and other private entities who are not necessarily end user delivery, but they're the, the intermediary are rolling out fiber. Crown Castle, uh, uh, American Tower. Uh, Crown Castle bought Light, Light, I uh, can't think of it, um, Light Tower uh, a number of years ago, and that's a, a fairly extensive fiber network. Uh, if you looked at their, actually their New York City fiber network, it's very extensive. They own a lot of fiber in New or California. And for that, they're deploying the fiber out to the DAS sites that the cellular companies are using. So you can imagine they'll be in play to roll out the fiber for the 5G networks that get deployed. You got smart cities, and I'll talk a little bit about smart cities in a little bit. And then the, the AT&T Mobility, Verizon are actually deploying some of their own fiber. I didn't know how to call this next section, but we did a study uh, a number of years ago for the FCC on 5G and what it means. And what they asked us to do is they wanted us to estimate the number of 5G cell sites that would be uh, required nationwide and the potential cost for that, not only for the 5G equipment, but also for the fiber backhaul network required for that. So as we did the study, we looked at four, four scenarios. One was with ubiquitous coverage, so nationwide coverage with a typical average user taking or using about two gigs a month. That's on the low side today. But at that point in time, it was about average. And when we looked at it, it was about a $61 billion requirement to build up the network for one provider. We then looked at a scenario two, which was trying to look out 10 years. 
uh, in which the average user used about 50 gigabits, and that jumped it up um, by a factor of about 250 percent uh, to 145 billion. If you go to the bottom one, they actually asked us to look at an autonomous vehicle coverage nationwide, not only in urban areas, but nationwide. So we deployed, uh, it was 200 meter cell sites on every highway in the country, every secondary road in the country, and in the urban areas. And in that case, it jumped to $250 billion for that network. If you want to know about the counts and the, and the breakdown, the biggest thing is on that bottom one, the 250 was broken out between $57 billion just for the fiber backhaul required to connect all those sites together. The equipment was $193 billion. If you go to the counts, our estimate of counts is about we have a total count, which includes some macro cells on the one side, and then the micro grids, which are about 200 meter cell grids on the right hand side, about 400,000, potentially up to 2.6 million. So it really depends on the extent of this network, and should the government step in and say, we really need this 5G network ubiquitous. If they say that, you can look at how many cells are required and what that total investment may be. So now let me jump to another broad topic on just the economics of fiber. So I had to throw in a hockey stick because everybody has a hockey stick in their presentation. But what this one is, is we did a national study. We looked at the fiber deployment cost to every home and business in America. And for that, we looked at the investment per subscriber or per location passed. And we looked at it on two bases. One was where the, the carrier had a penetration rate of about 70% or a take rate of 70% and one where that penetration or take rate was about 35%. And what you see is once you get down to about 15 and what, I'm sorry on the bottom side we looked at linear road density. Linear road density is how many locations do you have per road mile and that's the biggest driver of the economics of network deployment for any provider whether it's electric, telephone, uh, road networks, any of that type, it's all about linear density. So as you look at that, the inflection point is around, it depends on which one you look at, somewhere between 10 and 20. So we chose 15. It's kind of that inflection point where the investment starts to skyrocket and the economics start to fall apart. We then looked at it on a, what we estimate to be the average cost per month for that subscriber. So that includes the operational cost, replacement of CapEx because it failed, whatever it may be. And again, we looked at, you know, what, where does it start to fall apart? Um, and how many subscribers are there? So you can see when that linear density uh, is a bit more than 20, you start to get into a reasonable, you don't have a, a lot of those customers. But once you get back below 20, it skyrockets the number of customers whose average monthly cost is well above $75. And the typical ARPU will not make that up. So you're going to lose money in those markets. So now you may be curious, what parts of the country have a linear density below 15? It's actually most of the country. So for the deployment of fiber to make economic sense, it truly only makes economic sense for a rational business in the white parts of the map. And this isn't a slide against cable companies, but cable companies typically operate in the white parts of the map. And that's because when they go into cable franchise areas, many times they'll have an agreement in place with the municipality that we will deploy in areas of a certain density. And they know at what density they will make money and at what density they will not. And it typically actually aligns up fairly well with this. And then if you flip this over to well, let's see what parts of the country are profitable, potentially, for a fiber provider. And again, this is, this is residential and business service that we're looking at. And what we put on the scale here is green are great areas. The typical monthly cost will be under $35. You can make a lot of money there. Uh, and if you get your take rates up, even more. When you get into the yellow and the light green, it becomes a bit marginal. The orange and the red are the areas that you will tend to avoid. And if you look at the FCC's 477 data, you'll typically see this pattern, typically. But there are areas of the rural parts of America that have fiber, 
And the reason for that is there have been externalities entered into it. The FCC has provided money. States have provided money for that broadband deployment. So if you think about, and I talked about some of these yesterday, New York State provided $500 million in funding to encourage 100 megabit deployment within her state. By the end of this year, New York will have 99.9% .9 of its households and businesses will have access to 100 megabit service. And that's only because the state stepped in with extra money to help for that deployment. The FCC provides over $4 billion annually to build out broadband networks in rural areas. Some of that is in fixed wireless, uh, but some of that is in, in fiber that's being deployed. The FCC recently completed an auction, and this was for the very high cost parts of the country. In that auction, they awarded out about $1.5 billion. Many of the winners are offering 1G service. Many of those winners are rural electric co-ops. So it's a new competitor in the marketplace. So where there are electric co-ops, they are primed to compete. They have a huge cost advantage. They have no make-ready cost. They have a, a, an outside plant force that can quickly install fiber. And many times they have fiber in place be, because of smart meters that are required in many parts of their network. Uh, so we see their network cost actually being the best we've seen. Um, and it's, 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 it's a bit scary for the incumbent carriers just because you now have, and this is more of a regulatory issue, you now have a protected monopoly provider using their protected monopoly assets to enter into a regular, uh, unregulated market and compete. So, There's other states looking at this as well. We're working with the states of Pennsylvania, Georgia, and Maine, who are looking at programs to deploy high-speed broadband in their states. And then there are municipalities. Uh, there's 192 members. Uh, this was as of last month, so it's still increasing, where municipalities have taken it upon themselves to deploy fiber in their cities. And there's, there's an announcement, I, I mentioned it yesterday, there will be a major organization working with municipalities to get out fiber to a million homes owned by the municipality. So again, another competitor to the incumbent carriers. So now let's jump into a focus on the cable system. This is very similar to what the telephone systems did a number of years ago. The telephone systems had a copper network and they had to decide how they would expand their broadband to compete against cable. And cable had a much superior system, could deliver a much superior service of broadband because of the coax system, so the telcos had to respond. Verizon came out with their Fios network, which is a full fiber to the home. AT&T did a fiber to the node, which is basically fiber deep. They pushed fiber farther out into the system so that copper could provide additional bandwidth to the home. So what is fiber deep? This is a typical or a depiction of a typical HFC system. You have a hub that uh, has the electronics in it, has the cable management or the CMT, CMTS system, which uh, com communicates with the cable modem, goes out on a trunk, which is typically fiber, to a, uh, that red dot there that you see is the fiber node. And then from that, it's coax through a system out to the homes. And when you see that, the little uh, triangles that you see are the amps. The problem with the current HFC system is amps introduce noise, introduce problems into the system, and restrict the ability to provide a good quality signal. So what the cable systems are trying to do is remove the number of amps in the system. And to do that, what they do is they do an overlay of their system with additional fiber and put additional nodes out into that system. So what they were at was probably about 750 homes passed per fiber node on that coax system. And the coax was potentially upwards of 5,000 feet. And in that, you may have had three or four active amplifiers which degraded the signal. With this, what they're trying to get it down to is you know, two to 500 homes passed, which one, increases the potential bandwidth to the consumer, but also reduces the number of actives. But as you think about it as an appraiser, you all of a sudden start to see additional obsolescence here because those amplifiers that were passed with the fiber now become obsolete because they're no longer used. Some of that coax system that's sitting out there was overlaid with fiber. So again, you have some additional obsolescence in the system. If you looked at it from a new build perspective, 
it would look a little bit different because you wouldn't have some of the overlays uh, of the old coax system. So you can start to see on a, from the appraisal standpoint what parts of the system are obsolete. Now we go to an, a, a system that they're trying to do in which they make sure there are no actives in the network. And actives refer to the number of amplifiers between the fiber node and the customer. If you can get to that system, you have a pure coax system out to the customer, you can deliver a lot of bandwidth to that customer, uh, and the quality of that signal is fairly high. But again, once, when, when you look at this, you've got additional obsolescence adjustments that you have to think about. That cable systems books have the coax on the system. You've now overlaid part of that system with fiber. What is the value of the overlaid coax? It's virtually nothing because it's not being used, and it's actually been uh, replaced with a superior asset being fiber. If you were to build that system fresh, it would look like that. So you can kind of see that obsolescence or that overlay impact that you have in the system. Now, and actually let me go back to this. This is more the fiber deep. So when we say fiber deep, what they're really trying to get to is the, the no actives. Typically many fiber deep systems, when I talk to the engineers, they're trying to get the fiber node to serve about 60 homes. So they've gone down from where they were years ago at about 700. They're pushing down to 60. The max distance of the coax, they want to try and get that down to under 1,000 feet. At under 1,000 feet, you don't need any amps. So this is what they're trying to get to now to augment their system to now compete with some of the fiber competitors that I talked about. So they're, they're now reacting the same way the telcos acted years ago to go against the cable system. But the ultimate system is the fiber to the prem system. The fiber to the prem system provides kind of that, that future proof system of fiber, ultimate capacity, capacity dependent upon the electronics you put on the end, not dictated by the medium that you use in between. And with this system, you can also support 5G, you can support other customers, so it's a very robust system. But once they start doing this, again, you have to think about the obsolescence impact of this. Verizon had it many years ago. They had Fios in the ground, but they also had a copper network. And the FCC and state agencies actually required them to keep the copper network in and alive at the same time the fiber was in. What is the value of that copper? And that was a discussion point that we had for years with the, the, the t telephone systems, and we still have it. AT&T is facing that now as they push fiber out into neighborhoods. They're doing a lot of fiber to the home uh, deployment in many cities across the country. They're gonna have the same issue. And Comcast, Charter, Cox will have the same issue as they push fiber out. You have two duplicative networks, one that has no value, but has a lot of dollars on the books. And how do you adjust for that? And that's where, I won't get into it much, but that's where the RCN comes into play. The RCN is that replacement cost new, and it captures that full cost of that replacement technology which is fiber to the prem. So that's what it would look. It's a very clean system when you build it new, but in the actual systems out there, it's a very dirty system with the books very dirty. Um, duplicate assets, all that type of stuff that you really need to figure out how to get out of the system. So let me, let me talk you through where the cable systems are right now. So many of the cable systems are thinking we need to do this fiber deep. We want to leverage our coax assets and get the best signal out there possible at the cheapest price we can. So we're fiber deep. Typically on an HFC system, the, the targets are between 300 and 750 per fiber node. With fiber deep, as I mentioned, it drops down to 60 to 80. The max coax distance uh, with a typical HFC system may get up to 5,000 feet. With that, you may have to have three amps in the system to get out to the customer. With a fiber deep, you're pushing it down now to 1,000 feet, no actives in the network. So this is, it's an ugly picture, and I apologize for the picture, but you'll see the contrast between this picture and the next picture. And what I really want you to focus on here is the green boxes. The green boxes are actually the fiber nodes. Those fiber nodes may cost between 5,000 and 10,000 a piece to deploy out in the network. So this is what their system may look like today for a city. This is actually a city in Nevada that we'd looked at, and you can kind of see that deployment. 
The next picture is when we say, let's go fiber deep. And you can see the expansive growth of those fiber nodes. Each of those fiber nodes, again, may cost upwards of $10,000 a piece. And that actually is a five-fold increase in the number of fiber nodes. So we can look at the counts. But before we do that, I just want to throw back up. This is actually what a fiber to the prem system would look like, very much like the uh, HFC system, because in a fiber to the prem, you're moving the splitter back to about 5,000 feet to the customer. There is no worry about uh, the issue of um, amplifiers. You don't have to amplify the signal at that distance. The only issue with fiber to the prem is typically you want to reduce the number of splice points. And a, a reel of fiber can typically get you up to about 5,000 feet, potentially. So now let's look at that investment. So this is, this is I, I actually had it as a greenfield. And I took the word greenfield off because there's sensitivity about the word greenfield. So this is a new build cost. So if I were to build that neighborhood again today, and I said, let's build it with HFC. With HFC, it's about $48 million. Drop is that connection to the home out to the street, 3.2 million. The outside plant, which ca captures the coax, the amps, the fiber feeder, the make ready cost, uh, gets you to 42 million. And then the fiber node is 2 million. On the fiber deep side, you can see if I were to build this new, fiber deep is the most inefficient new deployment you could ever do. It was the same with the UVerse platform. It was the most inefficient platform you could deploy if you were building new. So as you look at that system, and the HFC, we had 1.9 million feet of coax, 600,000 feet of fiber. On the fiber deep, it flips. But if you add those two numbers together, they're actually pretty close as to the total distance. Where you see the big jump is on the fiber nodes. So in the HFC system, we had 207 fiber nodes. Average locations per fiber node was 515. In the fiber deep, it goes up to 1,488, actually a seven-fold increase in the number of nodes in that network. The number of locations now drops down to in that design criteria of 70 homes per that fiber node. You can look at it on the chart. You know, I threw this up just to have a nice little pretty picture. Um, but again, you see the biggest differentials are the fiber feeder jumps, the coax drops, those kind of wash out. But what really drives the uneconomic nature of the system is that fiber node. So you, you have to ask yourself, well, why, why are the providers doing this? Why? It's uneconomic. Jimmy just said it was the worst system to build. Why would you do that? So if you think about the new build cost, the incremental difference between the two is about $12 million between the two builds, about a 25% increase. This is actually very similar. We, we ran these studies when we were looking at the AT&T network, very similar percentage increase for fiber to the node, their U-verse platform. It was actually a 20 to 25% premium uh, over a, um, the, what they had in the network at the point in time. But it is a superior network. This can provide broadband speeds upwards of a gigabit to the customer. So the question becomes, why do they do it? Well, there, you can look at this. Well, what is the incremental investment or that brownfield change? I've got an existing network in place. How can I leverage that coax? Well, the incremental investment here is $20 million. So for the executives of Comcast, for Charter, for Cox, they look at this and they go, we can do fiber the prem, or we can augment our system fairly quickly and cheaply compared to a full fiber build and get upwards of a gigabit service out to our customers. What do you do? Well, the executives are doing exactly the brownfield change. And that's why, because of the incremental change. Now, let me, let me jump to the new network, which is fiber the prem and how that compares. And if you look at the build cost, uh, fiber to the prem is the gray bar, the total build cost. Actually, it's about a two to 5% incremental difference between an HFC network. So a little marginally more expensive, but the superiority of it is vastly greater. So as you think about it from the appraisal side, you need to look at and think about this but as you think about it from the business side, you need to think about the, the incremental or brownfield change. There's just a dichotomy there. 
And as you think about it as assessors or appraisers, you really have to think through, yeah, I know that's what the company's doing right now, but the fiber of the prem network is the most logical choice for a replacement cost new because it is the most economical, the most superior system I can deploy today, and that's what the willing buyer would think about. And I'll get into that. So this is the comparison. So the HFC system was a 48 million, the fiber deep, 60 million, fiber to the prem, 50 million. So again, why does that subject plant owner go the fiber deep path? And simply, it's the economics. I can do a fiber or a brownfield deployment of that fiber deep for 20 million versus a full expansion of 50 million, and I can push into the future the need for the full fiber deployment. We know it will happen at some point. It may be five, 10 years out, but I can push it five, 10 years out. And if I look at the net present value of my cash flows, far superior decision, maybe. If you look back in time, Verizon and AT&T had the same choice. The two carriers went completely different paths. And you could argue who made the right decision at that point in time. Uh, and we won't get into that argument today. So the, the question, I, you know, I want to turn this back to the appraisal side, um, just so you have a, a, a sense of how we need to think about this as appraisers, as assessors, to properly value the plant. So as I go out to the engineers and I go out to the business managers and I ask them, if you were able to build the network new today, what would you build? And they all say, we would build fiber to the prem. It's cheaper to maintain, a far superior network. I can sell more services over it. It's stickier. Um, I, I save a lot of cost on my operations. Fiber is passive optical, which means there's no active electronics out in the network. I don't really have a lot in the outside plant to maintain other than the squirrels eating through my fiber cable. On the coax system, I have active fiber nodes out there that have electric run into it. I've got an electrified system that goes to the consumer's house. I've got coax that degrades much quicker than fiber, much more expensive to maintain. When I think of provisioning, much easier to provision over a fiber network than a coax network. Uh, repairs, again, much cheaper on a fiber. So as you think about it, and this is why the business managers and the engineers would say, I'm going to deploy fiber to the prem. So as you think about it, and you look at those costs, and you, you, you talk to the engineers, they quickly understand, and understand that fiber deep is a bad choice for a new build. So why, why in an appraisal, why in a valuation exercise, would you consider a fiber deep exercise? Because it, it inflates the cost. So we can look at a you know, fiber to the prem business case, and I threw these up. We, we do these all the time. Um, we actually support some engineering teams. Uh, we may be supporting that firm that's rolling out a, uh, fiber to a million homes. We're actually doing the design in the background of how that fiber network will look. And we put these business cases together for them so that they can understand where should we deploy that fiber and how should it be done. And we put these demographics together you know, who are you passing? How many road miles are you covering? What's the demographic of the population? We can use the demographic of the population to estimate take rates. Take rates is a key component of the financial capabilities of that system. If I can get 70% take rate, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy. Uh, and we're seeing that in uh, some of these rural deployments uh, of fiber systems. Many of those providers are getting upwards of 70% adoption rate on their platform. And I'm assuming many of the providers in this room would love to have 70% penetration. Uh, it's just, it's a difficult thing to obtain. And the reason rural uh, companies can get this, for the most part, the competition just has a, lack of a better term, crappy network. Uh, it's a, typically a DSL network. There typically isn't a cable competition in that. So their choice is DSL at six megabits, satellite maybe 25 or I get fiber with upwards of a gigabit service. And I was at a, a conference, it was last year, um, in which a number of cities were there and it was the city of Fairlawn uh, in Ohio 
has deployed their own network. They offer a gigabit, symmetric gigabit, to their customers at $60 a month. And how many would sign up for gigabit service at 60 bucks a month today? You know, you would, you're there, right? Well, they actually have four customers at that point in time that actually signed up for 10 gigabit service. And I think the 10 gigabit service, symmetrical, was like 300 a month, but they actually had four subscribers on a 10 gig service, residential, residential subscribers. And you know, the questions came up, well, who in the heck is getting a, who needs 10 gig? I mean, I, I have 25 meg in my home and I'm happy, but 10 gig, it, they're, they're, what they surmised, it was gamers who wanted that ultimate virtual reality on their game and they're buying 10 gigabit service. So when we talk about where is the internet going today, 100 megabit, when New York did 100 megabit, that was, you know, we were really happy back two years ago. But now we're talking 10 gigabit service. What can provide 10 gigabit service? Can coax? Sorry, it can't. Um, unless you only had one subscriber off the fiber node, because with the fiber node, you get about 10 gigabits on the shared pipe, so potentially. Can AT&T's network? No, sorry. The DSL network cannot get... 10 gig. E I, yeah, the <laughs> copper pair just isn't there. It's just not there. So as you think again, as you think about this, it's 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 kind of scary where internet speeds are going. I you know I thought a gigabit service was just quite amazing that anybody would want a gigabit service, but now we're into the 10 gig environment. So just put that in your head. So as you, again, you come back to the. Fiber deep, that fiber deep is an interim fix to the ultimate solution because we're going to get to the point in day, or the day, someday, down in the future, where people will demand 10 gigabit service. And you can't do that over a coax system. So the fiber to the fiber deep is a truly incremental solution. I threw this up just to put a lot of numbers on a chart. Uh, but we do 30 year business cases. And part of that is just trying to look at the cash flow. And the cash flow is the key thing to this whole concept of appraisals. Um, you're really trying to think of the willing buyer. As I think about that system, what is the nature of the cash flows that I could obtain if I built a new network versus what are the cash flows if I buy the subject? And that really truly is what I will pay for it. A business owner, a, that person, when they make the decision, they're looking at the cash flows and how that, what is the best price to pay for the subject is really, it's a very simple concept. So if you think about that replacement cost approach, and I may have stole a little bit of this from something Carl wrote recently, but you know, the appraisal is comparing the subject property to its most likely replacement. And if you look at the American Society of Appraisals, Valuing Machinery and Equipment, third edition, the replacement property would be the most economical new property replacing the service provided sub from the subject property. So we'll stop there. As you think about what I showed you, and you think about the cable companies, and we're trying to determine how to value those cable assets, how do we do that? You know, we, we have to think, and we have to come back to our training and what it tells us. So what do we look at? We know the subject property is providing a service out to the customers that may give us 300 megabit on the, some of the current systems. So we have to design and deploy a system that meets that subject's nature. So it could be fiber deep, could be the HFC, could be the fiber to the prem. And as I showed you the numbers, fiber deep, you'd throw out right away. So then the decision comes down to do I work with the HFC RCN or do I work with the, fiber, uh, the full fiber to the prem? So you have to think of additional things about that. So one, you, you have to recognize the prudent buyer will not pay more for the property than the cost of acquiring that substitute. They have to take into account considerations of all physical depreciation, as, as well as any functional and external obsolescence. That's the key thing here. As we think about now, do I do HFC or do I do full fiber to the prem? So 
What option? It really comes down to options. What option will I choose? I put here, fiber to the prem is the likely choice. It's the choice of most experts. It's the choice that provides the greatest value. And I'll show you it provides the most efficient and best option for that willing buyer. So this is, you know, I, I'm not an ASA. I'll admit that. I'm a cost expert. I'm an, a kind of an economist by training. And I always think of opportunity cost and the cash flow decision. And this is a busy chart, but it really, it, to me, emulates what that decision of the replacement cost new to the subject asset and what I will pay. So if you look up there, that is the replacement cost new. I've, I've decided to look at a fiber network. And what I need to look at are the future cash flows decisions of the subject, which is the dashed line, and what that potential alternative is and what its potential cash flows. And basically, when we think about obsolescence measures, we're looking at the differentials in those cash flows over time. So when we think about the replacement revenue, if I stick with the subject system, I'm going to start losing customers because the competition is coming in. I'm going to lose them over time. So my revenue stream will start going down. When I think about the revenue of a full fiber of the prem, I may start a little bit lower entering the market, but I will far exceed the system because I have greater functionality. I can sell greater services. So there's a differential in my revenue streams that I need to think about. When I think about my operational cost, which is the green lines, that fiber to the prem system, actually before I get, let me go into the replacement of CapEx. So on the replacement, on the new system, I know there's gonna be failures, so I have to work in the cash flow of those failures over time. But those failures are fairly minimal, I have to maintain the system. But as I think about the subject system, I'm gonna to have to cure that over time. I'm gonna to have to get to a full fiber system at some point in the future, or my company's dead because I can't compete at all. So 10 years from now, I'm gonna be full fiber is what I said. So here's my replacement CapEx on this side versus the replacement CapEx here. You can all of a sudden start to see that differential cash flow in the CapEx. And this is really captured in your depreciation curves, this here. But then, as you think about this, I've got operational cost differences because that coax network is more expensive to maintain, provision, all the things I talked about. So I will have operational cost differences, uh, which are the green lines, the two green lines. Um, and I still have a differential out here at the end because I have a differential in customer count. So I have fewer customers to maintain on this network or that one. And then if I look at the maintenance of the network, there's a differential cost in the maintenance of the network. And I have additional cost to consider, which is I have to go out and remove all that coax plant. I may not be able to hang another fiber on the pole because of my agreement with the pole provider. I have to go out and pull that coax down and put the new fiber up. So I have a cost of removal of the coax. Built in here is the power savings from not having to power that system. So you have to take all those things into account. So as you think about this from the assessor and appraiser standpoint, you need to think about that replacement plant. One, I have to estimate the initial capex. I need to review the differences in ongoing capex uh, between the replacement and subject. I need to re review the differences in operational cost, the differences in uh, revenue between the two based upon the replacement I pick. And here's the, the odd case. If I were to pick the HFC system, that HFC system still has coax in it. I still have to power it. So, and, and I'm still, I am not gonna have to remove the coax. So when you think about additional obsolescence adjustments, those aren't available to me in that exercise because of the differentials in the network. However, when I go full fiber to the prem, and that's what I as a willing buyer think about, all of a sudden, these additional obsolescence adjustments pop out for me. I can look at coax cost removal. I can look at power cost savings. I can look at operational cost savings and lost revenue. So once you consider that, fiber to the prem will clearly be the choice network, not an HFC deployment. So 
we whacked out fiber deep as the logical choice. We are now whacking out HFC. We say, or I say, um, fiber the prem is the most logical choice of what a cable system would use today. However, and this is the big however, how does Pam, how does John go into to proceedings and discuss that with the assessor? Because what the assessor sees is the subject plant, it's coax, and you're telling me that you're gonna replace it with this theoretical fiber system that isn't yet being deployed. How, how it's, it's, I hate to say it, it's the sales job. It's, it's helping educate the assessors that from a theoretical construct, this is the correct approach. From actuality of what's happening in the plant today, they may not be doing it yet because of that incremental decision the business managers made that said fiber deep is the best way to go. So you just need to keep that thought in your head of how, how do you position this so that everybody at the table goes, I understand. I understand. The other issue this raises is you, you still have to do the, the additional um, depreciation adjustment to the system and you have to find the effective age. You now have a full fiber system. In the subject you have coax and fiber. What's the effective age that you come up with? That's another key decision and key thing that you have to talk through both sides, the assessors and the appraisers, to help understand what that is. And I'm going to finish up with a bubble chart. Just you know, We have a hockey stick chart. We have to have a bubble chart in every presentation. But it comes back to even when the business case says, yeah, in this footprint, fiber to the prem makes most sense. This is actually a, a bubble chart we did for a rural electric co-op. We identified the investment triggered by each and every home in their footprint, and we associated that back with the dot. And we said, let's color the dots of really dark magenta that you really can't see well here, over 10,000 per home passed. Who would make the decision to build that? Well, if, they want to, if they're a co-op and their members are the people that live in the area, they'll typically deploy there. But are there additional obsolescence adjustments that you may have to make because it's really an uneconomic customer. You are never, ever, ever, ever going to make the money back. 10,000 per home pass. If you have a take rate of 50%, just to make the math easy, that's $20,000 of investment. A quick calculation we always use to convert that to a monthly cost is about 0.2. So you have to get an ARPU from those customers of $400 a month. I'm not sure you can find any customer, if you can find them, that'll pay $400 for their service. So there is still even further obsolescence issues with this deployment. Even though from a full picture, the full business case that looked good, there are parts of that business case that look really bad. So just keep that in mind. And with that, I finished up. I got like uh, two minutes for questions. Where does wireless and 5G come into this as a competitive threat? It's an interesting question. It's a, it's, a, it's a significant threat to the incumbent players because that 5G system, you still need the fiber. So what the incumbent carrier has to decide of, do I support Steve? And Gary, do you support Steve? <laughs> so <laughs> I guess you won't have your fiber, so you're not going to be able to deploy. Um, so then Steve, you call Pam, and Pam says, I'd love to, Steve. Let's work together. But the issue for Pam is, when she does that, you're going to take all our customers. So it's, it's an interesting dynamic that's going to play out in the market. And to me, it's one of the more significant ones of recent time, because that 5G signal actually is a competitive threat now. Wireless local loop is, to an extent, um, it can get you speeds of 5 to 10 to 20, and some may say 100. Steve may say 100. But in reality, if you have a lot of customers on that system, you may have to deploy a lot more towers because you exhaust the capacity of your tower. 
but that 5G signal using you know, the, the millimeter wave all of a sudden changes the game. Yeah. Jim, can Pam and Gary say to T-Mobile, no, I won't do that? Gary probably could. Well, uh, I know. <laughs> I know Gary can. Uh, it, it's an interesting question because these are commercial services and they're going to have to run. That fiber necessarily won't be at the point Steve wants it. Steve wants it on a utility pole or a street lamp. Someone, Gary's going to have to send a crew out to run fiber to that. And Gary's going to tell his field forces, don't deal with Steve. We don't want to do that because he's a competitive threat. That may then come back to the FCC. And when we get Mignon up here, maybe we can ask her that question of, how does that interplay that the incumbent carriers have, a, have control of that physical network? How do the 5G players come in and actually then compete back with them? Yeah. Um, this is kind of more of a, a curiosity question. And if you can't answer, maybe Augie can. But for that $300 potential gamer um, fiber directly to the home price point, what, what is the demographic of the gamer? I, I think I immediately think of high school kid. Um, and, and that's where I'm, I, I'm off. Yeah, my, my quick answer is to go back to the 400 pound hacker. But um, <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. I, I don't know if you know Augie. Twenty-five to forty-four-year-old male making seventy-five thousand a year or more. You need more details? <laughs> Thanks a lot, Tim. That was really informative. Oh, let's take about a yeah, ten-minute break and start it. <laughs>